Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Joe Quirk, president of the Seasteading Institute. He is the co-author, along with Patrick Friedman, of Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and Liberate Humanity from Politicians. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Joe. Thanks for inviting me, guys. It's great to be with you. Now, it may be obvious from the, the term, but what is seasteading? Uh, just to get off at the, the at, at point one here. <laughs> Seasteading is homesteading the high sea, and the technology for building floating cities and floating communities on the ocean is at hand, and seasteaders want to make it happen sooner than otherwise because almost half the Earth's surface is unclaimed by any existing nation state, and uh, seasteaders want to empower people to uh, have basically startup nano nations on the ocean. That seems like a pretty bold, bold move that sounds pretty science fiction, which I'm sure, as you say in the book consistently, the, the biggest question you usually get is, are you crazy? Uh, and, and so maybe that's the next question is like, are you crazy? Uh, isn't the sea dangerous and volatile and barren? That'd be a good description of space. And yet people are taking going to Mars very seriously. And the thing about living on the ocean is that science fiction is science fact. Uh, we already have uh, uh, oil rigs, which are on the high seas and very high waves for uh, decades at a time. We have uh, cruise ships that are essentially self-governing floating cities. Um, and seasteading is a way of combining these two technologies for permanent living on the sea, combining with the governance technology of a cruise ship. Buckminster Fuller designed a floating city and unveiled it uh, way back in 1968. It was featured in Lyndon Johnson's White House, and people were taking very seriously the concept of floating cities. But the whole thing got uh, derailed by the Cold War as people got uh, distracted uh, by the race to space to compete with the uh, uh, Russians. And uh, guys like Elon Musk uh, were young kids growing up reading science fiction about going to Mars and imagining that by the time they were grown up, we were all going to go to Mars, and then they grew up and realized it's, it hadn't happened, and they're mad, and now they're trying to make it happen. But we're completely skipping the sea. And uh, I like to tell people that we live on planet ocean. Uh, Two-thirds of the Earth's surface is water. Uh, if you want to go deep down uh, below the ocean, you're basically – that's like 98% of the living space. If you're interested in uh, alien intelligence, we have – cephalopods like cuttlefish uh, that are highly uh, alien intelligences. But most interesting to seasteaders is the chance to completely start over um, and to empower as many people as possible to start over. So we have 193 nation states governing 7.6 billion people. Um, I live near Silicon Valley. Seasteading is sort of a Silicon Valley approach to the problem of governments sucking, which is basically if you think that solutions come from startups uh, and you think if you can create platforms whereby people can choose among different governance structures and you could actually create a peaceful market of governance at sea and people could choose among them you'd basically have a research and development department on the ocean for people to try different sort of governance ideas. And as long as people can choose among them uh, voluntarily, we will unleash uh, voluntary uh, tiny societies on the ocean that can uh, uh, attach to each other, get bigger, uh, break off from each other, go elsewhere. We'd essentially have a variation by governments and selection by citizens, which seasteaders believe will unleash evolution in governance itself. And you can imagine uh, libertarians are very attracted to this idea. So if the advantage of this, though, is that the you can build these things outside of the territory of governments, won't we just run into the same problem that Silicon Valley startups are starting to notice now with you know, government calls for regulation of Facebook that it's it's one thing when you're small and no one's really, you know, you, you're just ignored by the governments. But if seasteading actually became competitive um, or was done in substantial numbers, wouldn't governments just decide maybe we do own those parts of the seas and not allow it? 
I think the greatest uh, threat to seasteading is what you just described. It's certainly not technological or business or anything like that. And the great thing about uh, old governments is that they're dinosaurs. They move very slowly. They're very dumb. So Facebook can scale up and get a billion users before the government wakes up and starts getting upset that uh, people like Facebook better than them. And when people worry about, you know, governments uh, worrying about seasteads and doing something about it, I, I just cite uh, historical precedents. You know, um, China doesn't invade Hong Kong because it's a, a blatant uh, slap in the face of everything that communist China represented. You know, it's this little defenseless flea that created all these free markets and created so much prosperity. It basically persuaded China to change its views. Um, uh, the Cayman Islands off the coast of the U.S. has no standing army, takes a very spiteful stance with regard to welcoming medical mavericks and uh, financial innovators. And the U.S. doesn't invade it. They just sort of ignore it because it's it provides a surface. So I always think of if, if, if nation states are like sharks, uh, you want to if you're a seasteed, you want to think like a cleaner fish. You want to provide a service that the nation state appreciates. I think it'll take so long before seasteads are actually some sort of threat to existing governments uh, that uh, seasteads have the power to scale up considerably. Uh, there's a really great uh, precedent um, to show how little governments care about uh, you know, new floating societies that are very rebellious. So there was a, an abandoned uh, sea fort known as uh, Fort Ruffs off the coast of England. And it was outside the territorial jurisdiction of England at that time. And uh, there were some pirate radio stations out there playing pirate radio that was basically um, not legal because the BBC only wanted to play rock and roll sometimes. But this was fulfilling people's desire to, pay, to play music all the time. And this guy named Paddy Roy Bates basically sailed out there, um, kicked off the rivals, and declared himself a sovereign nation. And when the Royal Navy, a ship sort of strayed into what they claimed as their territorial waters, uh, his son, Michael, basically fired a warning shot. And it's like, WTF, what the, what, these guys are crazy. And so, so what happens? Is, is, uh, did, did Britain try to invade? Did they swoop in and, and, and shoot these three crazy guys? Uh, no, they just sort of ignored it. Um, and, and they kind of brought weapons charges against the Bates family. And a British judge ruled that, well, they're outside the territorial waters of Britain, so we don't have jurisdiction. And it kept getting crazier. Uh, another pirate radio rival uh, tried to invade and take the the little 120 meter nation away from <laughs> from from Bates, and they like captured him and imprisoned him. Um, and then so a, a German diplomat like went and negotiated with Bates as if he was a sovereign country. Uh, and then Bates see this, you know, released the prisoner, but then said, aha, you've negotiated with me. That means you recognize me as an independent state. So you couldn't get more provocative than these guys. They've established a three-generation dynasty on this silly little ugly sea fort. Um, the, the territorial waters of England has since expanded to include... Sealand, what's called the Principality of Sealand. Um, but they remain uh, a self-declared uh, micronation. Uh, Britain has not done anything about it. They're just letting them do their crazy thing. And, and last I checked, they were claiming uh, uh, $600,000 uh, $600, U.S. dollars uh, GDP just, just from selling like stamps and uh, sponsoring a soccer team and, and, you know, offering dukedoms <laughs> to people. Um, so, you know, I hope I'm involved with the first seasteading company now, and we're not going to be as provocative as that. We're not going to fire cannons at, at, at Navy ships. We're not going to capture people and imprison them. But if, if that crazy guy can uh, establish his own 
little nation and, and governments basically don't care. And he can actually make a profit. It's basically the ugliest, smallest nation in the world. I think that's a, a great precedent um, for uh, what seasteads are capable of and a great example of how little the old big governments don't care because attacking a floating algae farm is basically going to be a PR nightmare. Now, there are, what, 195 nations? 93, 193. 193 nations right now. Um, and they are competing with each other um, and it's you can you can move I mean some of them are more restrictive than others but you can move typically from one to another and yet none of them few if any of them are what libertarians would consider you know market utopias um, or the kind of place that were you know the, that we imagine these ceased beds might be and so if it if among those nearly 200 nations we haven't seen any of them embrace these kind, the kind of values that that we would like to see. What makes us think that the seasteads would be any better? Well, the stampede of people like us uh, racing to seastead to, to volunteer and get involved and make it happen. Um, so I, I think a a really cool way to look at this is through the lens of uh, special economic zones. So we tend to think of uh, nation states as being these great big things that control everybody inside them, but they're disintegrating from the bottom up. And so I mentioned Hong Kong earlier, the first interesting little special economic zone that uh, just a random experiment that happened accidentally through historical caprice created so much wealth, it ended up converting China into being a much more open market and a half billion people escaped extreme poverty. Um, that was such an interesting experiment that China allowed, you know, 14 more little special economic zones within its nation. And those all created so much wealth. Uh, right now, probably more than half of all Chinese people have migrated to these special economic zones. So in a sense, people are already have already left the old, poor, communist, rural China and moved to these much more prosperous free market places. This set a precedent where different countries around the world, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, started experimenting with little free ports, little, I think of them as legal islands, allowing special exemptions from taxes and regulations to create prosperity. And overall, some uh, special economic zones have failed, some have succeeded, some have been corrupted, some have been spectacularly successful, such as Shenzhen in China that basically more than 4,000 have proliferated uh, across the world in the last 50 years. It's completely peaceful. It's a bottom-up, uh, inside-out revolution in governance, as Tom W. Bell calls it. Who has been on, uh, he, who has been on Free Thoughts before? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the author of Your Next Government? Question mark From Nation States to Stateless Nations. Um, so it's already uh, happening um, but these things are only so free. So there's, a, there's this revolution in freedom. To me, this is the most momentous political revolution. It's sweeping the world. You mentioned 193 nation states. Well, over 4,000 special economic zones have them completely outnumbered. So the, Tom W. Bell is the kind of the John Adams, kind of the, the father of the sea zone, where he takes the best practices of all these special economic zones. And he wants to instantiate them on the first floating legal structure, which would be the sea zone, which we hope to establish in an island nation soon and continue this evolution of better, freer governance. That's interesting because your book is extremely uh, optimistic and kind of surprising to the point that it, it was, you feel like I felt like I was being pitched and I came to believe it more and more, almost almost like I was being pitched timeshares in Mexico, I can't miss real estate opportunity, all this stuff. But the really interesting thing about it was all these people, not necessarily libertarians, doing different technological things were kind of converging on the same idea in terms of how to get food, how to get energy, uh, how to get um, different things from the ocean, and how to build floating uh, structures that can sustain. It's, it's not just libertarians, it's coming from a bunch of different angles. Yeah, it's interesting. Like it's it actually works best if you don't say the L word because that sets up people's you know psychological immune systems. But as soon as you tell the world, hey, we're going to set up a platform you can 
completely start over with, with a new governance system. Innovators come stampeding to you. They don't need to self-identify as libertarian, no more than a, you know, an American vacationer who steps on a cruise ship uh, is changing ideologies because now they're getting free market health care and free market security on a self-governing ship. With a, with a dictator, known as a captain. <laughs> you know, they're not changing what their beliefs are, but it's about the proliferation of choices and providing different places where people can experiment with different social structures. And crucially, people bring their own uh, business ideas to seasteading like crazy. Uh, and environmentalists are interested in algae farms and seaweed cultivation, and conservatives are interested in a new frontier uh, people, socialists want to create their own seastead. Everybody with a different idea who wants to prove their point to the world can get their own seastead, build their own business model, and then succeed or fail in, in the eyes of the public on their own terms. That's the the great thing about seasteads is the uh, the people who try them absorb the cost of failure. And hopefully prosperity will be shared and the world can watch and see which systems work. And we don't have to rely on uh, politicians to impose systems from previous centuries from the top down on us. So practically, what does life on a seastead look like? Because I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, like the, the idea of living on an oil rig doesn't strike me as super appealing. Me neither. And it always depends on uh, whether we're talking about seasteading in 2025 or 2055. So I hope uh, that the, a company that I helped co-found uh, called Blue Frontiers will build the first very modest seastead uh, in French Polynesia, which is right in the middle of the Blue Frontier, which is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and if that works, that'll be for around uh, uh, 300 people. If people want to check it out, go to blue-frontiers.com. We have lots of visuals there. We've already designed how it's going to look. We've already got the engineers. And it's basically going to look like a floating hobbiton, uh, basically green roofs. It's going to look like any other island from a distance. It's going to be inside a protected lagoon, so there's no waves. So we're going to be using existing technology. It's basically... Uh, this, the same engineers who built the floating pavilion in Rotterdam are going to build something about seven and a half times as big, which will be the first seastead, if all goes according to plan with Blue Frontiers. So, but what about seasteading in 2055? Uh, 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 hopefully by then, you know, oil rigs already are way too expensive. Only uh, uh, oil and gas exploration companies can afford them. Um, so if you think of seasteads as the intersection, the confluence of material science, of 3D printing, uh, of people, I have colleagues working on geopolymer concrete and all this sort of stuff. The way it would work is basically the way Buckminster Fuller uh, designed it, you know, 50 years ago, which is much of the seastead will be deep below the water the physical structure of the seastead, where it'll have like tremendous ballast. So if you put a lot of weight uh, far down below the sea, um, uh, you can create incredible stability and then have pilings, which are basically pillars that go up high above the waves and then your city floats on top of it. Um, so you have these very high waves, your city well above it, um, and there's something called the flip ship. If this seems like futuristic to you, I'd, I'd encourage your listeners to look up the flip ship, F-L-I-P. It's been in operation uh, on the ocean since like 1962. Uh, and it's basically like a baseball bat thing. Think of it as a wine bottle um, that's much bigger, where four-fifths of it is below the ocean. Basically, it uses ballast tanks to float in the oceans. And it's described as being as stable as a fence post in 60-foot waves. And that's just one little floating uh, giant uh, wine bottle, you can think of it. And uh, Robert Ballard, uh, discoverer of the Titanic and famous uh, oceanographer, he's a seasteading fan. He's featured in the book. And he wants to take flips, put platforms on top of them high above the waves, 
and create uh, stable structures uh, on the sea. So in many ways, uh, large enough and deep enough structures on the ocean can be more stable and safe than coastal communities. Um, safer in tsunamis, which don't uh, become destructive until they reach land. Tsunamis are harmless on the deep sea. So it's it's basically the principle of of, of ballast below the oceans. Yeah, when I when I read the part about the flip, uh, I immediately went to look it up. As you and I do suggest listeners look it up. It stands for a floating floating instrument platform, and there's a video on YouTube of it of it turning. It's it's like a big barge, and then you fill it up, and then it floats with part of it sticking out, but four fifths of it underwater. It's it's pretty incredible. Um, you you get into in the book. You also get into. Uh, the, well, you seem to think the sea setting is almost imperative, first of all, rather than op, you know, rather than something it would be fun to do or good to do to get out of government, but it, imperative in terms of food production and fuel production. Food in particular is pretty interesting, What could how we could farm the sea. Yes. In the book, I feature uh, Ricardo Radulovich who was one of uh, many seaweed farmers um, who want to mass farm the oceans. And the amazing thing about seaweed is that um, there are thousands of different species of algae that are edible. Uh, it's more healthy than corn, wheat, or soy, which, on which we base much of the food we eat now, which is basically not healthy. Uh, and the incredible thing about um, ocean-based crops is that they can be environmentally restorative. So this is way beyond sustainable. And this is, you can think of this as the um, libertarian answer to environmentalist critiques, which is that um, there's a type of seaweed called uh, macrosynthesis, I think it's called. Uh, it's been called the, um, the redwood of the uh, ocean. And in order to build its biomass, these different kinds of seaweed need to uh, draw tremendous uh, nutrients and uh, carbonic acid from the oceans, basically. And our coasts are just um, polluted with dead zones, which are caused by uh, agriculture and all the agricultural runoff that runs into the oceans and dumps all this nutrient wealth that can be used uh, by seaweed farms, which would basically restore those areas. Uh, I'm very... Uh, intimately aware of this, I wrote a whole book before I discovered seasteading about the problems of uh, agricultural runoff and its effect on coastal oceans and its effect on marine mammals. It's it's really brutal. Uh, you can imagine these uh, dead zones, as they're called, uh, restored to their pristine conditions uh, by eating. Imagine if you had a company called uh, Restorative Foods. I was uh, trying to found a company like that with a friend of a libertarian friend of mine in uh, big agriculture uh, to try to make this go. And we spoke to maybe a half dozen seaweed farmers in California, uh, none of whom have a particular ideology, but all find the regulations in California and in the U.S. so onerous they can't scale up their vision, and they want to get outside. Uh, the existing jurisdictions and scale up their seaweed farms. And Neil Sims, who I also features in, in the book, uh, he's a fish farmer. He says, uh, you know, first come the farms and then come the cities. You got to establish the uh, business model out there. It's just like the Western frontier and that seasteads can be thought of as the covered wagons. You get out there, you get your seaweed farm, you get some workers on there, you start hiring people, then the towns will come on their own. What's the economy of these things look like? Like, I guess I'll start with just how much would it cost to live on one of these early or in development seasteads? So the first seastead in the early 2020s that will be established by Blue Frontiers will have to be competitive with beachfront property. So if you take, uh, it's going to be about 7,500 square meters if you divide that up among 300 people, it comes out to about uh, $200,000 per person, um, which is uh, steep, but some of the islands are designed for small apartments uh, and things like that. So it has to be the only way the uh, close to shore seasteads will compete economically is that they have to offer something 
that's less expensive than the land that's right on shore, especially the beachfront property. And the great thing about seasteads is that even though it may be more expensive um, to build a floating uh, neighborhood than a neighborhood on land, the land is more expensive than the water. The seastead doesn't have to pay for the land. So if you establish a sea zone in a lagoon uh, off the coast of some beautiful uh, uh, bungalows in Tahiti, we could conceivably uh, make the seasteads cheaper than what people are already paying for uh, with bungalows and hotels and apartments uh, on the beaches of Tahiti. So do you expect people like in the first wave to be uh, telecommuters from Silicon Valley kind of people? Because it doesn't, there's no jobs there. I mean, you don't have someone who's going to work at McDonald's able to go live on a seastead, not only because they can't afford it, but there's no McDonald's there or other services. So as initially, is it, do you expect kind of people uh, who are telecommuting to live there? The first one is going to feature uh, various businesses. It's very important to me that the first seastead set a stellar uh, example. So we plan to have um, scientific researchers in the blue economy, uh, wave energy generation technologies on there. Uh, we plan to have homes for students to come and learn. Um, it, I want it to be beautiful and to integrate economic classes. So some of it will be villas for you know families. Others will be small apartments. And all those people will require services. Um, and so uh, we hired uh, an economic modeling firm known as MC, which uh, gave a, a third-party estimate that by the time the we're going to do these seasteads in three phases, and the first one succeeds, we're, it's going to triple in size over about 10 years. And they uh, made a, um, an independent uh, assessment of the economic activity that will be created by this when you consider uh, ecotourism and potential underwater uh, apartments where you can see through the aquarium walls uh, at how floating seasteads can be environmentally restorative and the commuting back and forth. It'll be a short ferry ride from, from shore, so people will probably work there and go back and forth. Uh, MC estimated that by the end of phase three, when there'll probably be less than a thousand people on there, uh, the the seastead will uh, produce, it, uh, you know, at least 760 direct jobs and a lot more indirect jobs. When you consider uh, entrepreneurship uh, on shore to service the various uh, people that will be coming out to visit this amazing floating island that looks like a real island. Uh, and that's not uh, Blue Frontier's estimates. That's a that's a third, an independent third party. So once you're on the water, there's all sorts of things you can do better, uh, like solar, for instance. Uh, floating solar is about 20% more efficient than solar on land because you use the water to cool the solar panels. And uh, the first seastead, the engineers who work with us plan to uh, use that warmed water to for the showers, for the dishwasher, for all that sort of stuff. So even just the sheer uh, incubation hub and the center for excellence that will be concentrated on the seastead alone, I think will give work to all sorts of network effects so that as people expand Anyone that wants a new jurisdiction where they could do something interesting, they will come to you. And probably the industry most beating on our doors is uh, medical research and healthcare professionals who want to get outside existing systems and start regulatory startups. What does the governance system look like? Like, do the people who live there have an input into the the laws and regulations on the seastead? Are there taxes or fees? Does this does it look like you know? being on a cruise ship like that that you know dictatorship that you mentioned earlier or does it look more like a democratic nation state uh well if it's when it starts very small it'll be uh under the jurisdiction of french polynesia which will also be under the jurisdiction of france but we will negotiate considerable regulatory uh and administrative autonomy through the sea zone and if french polynesia signs into law our sea zone It'll basically be no personal tax, no corporate tax. It'll be largely uh, self-regulating. 
and uh, the go- we're, we're committed to the decentralization of governance. Uh, the currency we're committed, uh, the, the token of exchange we're committed to using is called Varyon, V-A-R-Y-O-N, which is uh, sort of like a, a cryptocurrency um, that people are buying already. They're in, we're in pre-sale now to raise money for the Seastead. So it'll be radically uh, decentralized, and people who own Varyon will have a say in some governance decisions. So the whole philosophy of seasteading and our approach to uh, currency is the decentralization of power. So we want to take uh, special economic zones to the next step in evolution, which is governance will be developed uh, from the bottom up. I can get into more details on that. But the, the basic idea is that as long as people can create different societies voluntarily, go bankrupt if they don't work, and then other people can choose them voluntarily. And the crucial mechanism is that people can leave voluntarily. You could detach your miniature island, float away, and go somewhere else. So if you can decentralize the very ground beneath your feet, we'll develop uh, governance from the bottom up. Uh, so the best way of governing ourselves, no one knows how to do it, but we, uh, it waits to be discovered on the oceans, in my opinion. Now, you guys have lots of intelligent listeners, so I'm sure they want the actual uh, details. If I was in the mainstream, I wouldn't get into this. But So what, you know, what are the first floating islands by Blue Frontiers? How are they going to be governed? Um, they're going to be maximally inclined towards uh, economic and personal freedom. And so basically, in, in, with French Polynesia, if they pass the sea zone... Blue Frontiers and French Polynesia will choose a peer group of countries among the most peaceful and prosperous and well-run countries on Earth. And then those countries will choose uh, the regulations in the sea zone. And the way it works is if all those, say there's a dozen you know, of the best countries, uh, if all of those have a law or a rule, they can all agree that that law or rule should be on the sea zone. If a single country dissents, say uh, Switzerland says our country runs just fine without that rule, even though the other 11 countries say they require it, then that rule or regulation won't be instantiated on the sea zone. So it's uh, when I first joined the Seasteading Institute, I learned the term uh, strategic incrementalism. So it's going to be the next step. It's going to be the most socially free and the most economically free. But because it's not yet on the high seas, it won't be completely free. You know, criminal law, France will be in charge of that. And so it'll sort of be like uh, taking slow engineering steps uh, out onto the high seas while also taking steady uh, legal steps uh, towards uh, uh, steadily towards complete freedom on the high seas, which is the ultimate goal of seasteading. Well, and as you say in the book, <clears throat> many times that, and I've said in different contexts too, is that one of the goals of freedom is you don't exactly know what it looks like because freedom is a discovery process. And so at this stage in seasteading, I think the analogy you use is, is asking whoever created the transistor what uh, the computer look, what kind of things people will do on the computer in the future, whereas the architecture is the transistor, but who knows, you know, the app store and what apps are going to be created, that's all unpredictable in its own way. Yeah, apps, I, I love the analogy of apps because, you know, people say, well, what what kind of government are you going to create, Joe Quirk, on your Seastead? And, and, you know, t- t- not to compare myself to Steve Jobs, but I'll do it anyway. It's like Steve Jobs wasn't creating an iPhone so he could have an iPhone with one app on it. He's trying to create the platforms where other people can bring their apps, in my case, governance apps. And as long as people can choose among them, uh, the best apps will emerge and the the crappy ones will go away. And then we'll have this huge proliferation of things we couldn't imagine serving us in the area of governance that that certainly we couldn't imagine before we had the platform. And I always use the analogy of, of Ben Franklin, the difference between you know, centralized control of innovation, monopolies, and decentralized experimentation. So Ben Franklin, genius, uh, innovated in the control of electricity and innovated in governance. 
uh, one of the most advanced guys of his day. So his uh, experimentations with and uh, control of electricity led to um, uh, inventions that he couldn't possibly have imagined, that have permeated every area of our life. It's the only reason we're able to talk about it. Ben Franklin wouldn't even recognize a light bulb. You know, from the, from the Franklin stove to this iPhone I'm talking to you on, no one could have come to him and said, well, what good will this electricity do? How, how, will, how will people be lit in the future? He couldn't have really answered. But he also um, helped write the rules, the parameters for the United States government with a quill pen when uh, information traveled at the speed of a horse. And we haven't had any updates since then. We've added more rules. We, we have the same methods by which we choose our rulers. Uh, it's, it's changed over time, but there haven't been startups. There haven't been revolutionary uh, new ideas that the Ben Franklins of today can try out. And, you know, the North America at that time was basically a giant seastead where the smartest people in the world went and tried something new and it worked so much better. It ended up converting the whole world. And, uh, you know, I think of another story I like to tell is um, Steve Wozniak. I think of Steve Wozniak as a modern Ben Franklin. He uh, he worked at Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard was a big, monstrous company. Uh, Steve Wozniak was loyal to Hewlett Packard. He loved working at Hewlett Packard, and he designed the personal computer. And he pitched it to his superiors at Hewlett Packard uh, five separate times. They said no five separate times, and with great reluctance, he quit. Um, and he went off and founded a company with Steve Jobs that Steve Jobs named Apple. And that design became the initial design for the personal computer. So if Steve Wozniak couldn't leave and try something else outside at his own risk, we wouldn't have had Apple. It wouldn't have happened. So to me, Seasteading is a platform for the Wozniaks of governance. The, the internet and books are full of people with all sorts of ideas for how governance could work better. And there's no place where they can be tried out. You know, my co-author on this book is Patry Friedman. He's the grandson of Milton Friedman. He's the son of David Friedman. I'm very persuaded by their ideas. I would like to have a place where those ideas can be tried and to see what emerges uh, unpredictably. It'll certainly be better than whatever I can imagine and whatever emerges among floating societies in uh, 2035 will not resemble the ide ideologies we have now. It'll completely defy our limited little minds because we'll engage the global brain on behalf of uh, innovating in governance the same way the global brain has innovated on behalf of uh, technologies based on electricity. Now, if I've learned anything from uh, you know, movies like uh, The Perfect Storm or uh, the crab fishing show, but Deadliest Catch, uh, that the, the sea is pretty dangerous and it has some pretty bad storms that come up. And you mentioned tsunamis, and but even in this place in Tahiti, uh, if, if it is modular to the point that you can actually detach one of them, if a typhoon comes, won't that almost just destroy the entire thing? The oceans are very dangerous, uh, just as uh, tornadoes on land are dangerous. And we should keep in mind that, you know, planes still fly and boats still sail the seas. So you want to start your seastead not in high wave conditions, preferably close to the equator where waters are warm and very low. Um, the French Polynesia, especially the areas around where we're going to start seasteading if, if uh, French Polynesia approves, are some of the water uh, warmest and lowest, calmest uh, waters on the ocean. Um, and we'll start inside a protected lagoon, which is sort of a, a protected atoll, actually, which is like a natural wave breaker. It's like as the volcanoes slowly sink before, b below the oceans over millions of years, they form these nice little rings. Uh, where inside, it's like turquoise and lovely and calm. And you can put your seastead right inside one of those. And French Polynesia has many, many, many atolls stretching over an area the size of Western Europe, which is what uh, French Polynesia controls. But it's still, so, it's still a hurricane would, would disrupt that atoll to some extent, wouldn't it? 
Sure, but uh, they don't get uh, cyclones of that magnitude. Uh, we have to account our, our engineers are Dutch, and they build things to account for the, ten, the one in a 10,000-year uh, storm. They're very proud of that. Um, so uh, the big hurricanes that you see in other parts of the ocean don't really uh, occur in this area. They do get the occasional cyclone. Um, but the people who live on those islands and the boats that are there and the cruise ships that sail there all weather those things, and our first seastead will too. Uh, and it's about being sort of tethered uh, to the ocean inside an atoll, uh, tethered to the seafloor inside an atoll, creating a kind of stability. Realistically, how big can this get? So seasteading as a whole, like will it will it always remain small nations that? you know, a handful of people live on? Or will, could we see significant numbers of people eventually living on the open ocean? I think we could get a floating Hong Kong because as these different little things compete, um, some of them will work very well and then there'll be a runaway process where the economy will start to grow so fast that others will come. There's also an incentive to provide superior governance because the bigger your seastead, the more stable it is in waves and the longer it can stay out there. And I can imagine a floating Venice with little moats for roads where people can move their seastead in and out. But the more of these things you can lock up, the, the, the higher, you know, the, the more dangerous conditions you can remain in. You know, imagine, uh, you know, uh, oil platforms where there's a hundred or a thousand of them all locked up together. And to get an idea of how fast a prospering economy can grow, I, I always uh, point to Shenzhen, which is a fishing village that was right across the street from Hong Kong and was the first uh, imitation of Hong Kong that China allowed. And you know, at one point, there was just a little fishing village. They didn't even have a street light. And they just had tremendous growth, tremendous um, uh, property values ascending by, you know, 18,000% over a couple of decades. And now they make 90% uh, of our computer keyboards. Uh, that was just a little bit of freedom, a little bit new economy, and people raced there and created something new. So once you have a society that works, I think it will start out distributed. I think you will have lots of small little seasteads living in the doldrums near the equator. But the ones that succeed, I think, will attract more and more people. Um, so I, I actually do think we could conceivably have uh, cities with floating airports on the ocean, and our children will be flying to floating islands the same way they fly to uh, the Cayman Islands and not think it's weird. <laughs> you, uh, you point out in the book that a lot of it is about business. It's not, it's not as much about uh, governance and stuff. The, the latter part is, but about all these businesses that can be put onto the ocean, getting energy from the ocean and things like that. And, and that seems to be a really important component that, you know, you could say, hey, do you want to live out on the ocean? And maybe some people you'll find at a libertarian party convention will say yes. But, but the question of whether or not a business would go out there and build the kind of infrastructure and make money out of the ocean in order to build more and more and scale the problem up, uh, what kind of businesses are interested in this now? And, and do you, have you seen a growth in the amount of businesses that are looking at the sea for various, whether it's energy or getting out of the regulatory environment and stuff like that? Yes. I mean, as you very smartly point out, seasteading is not an ideology. It's a technology that requires a business model to pay for people to build it and float out there and actually move out there. So the people most interested in us, and yes, there is a constant acceleration of people coming to us with their ideas about the type of business they'd like to float, the type of technology they could develop. So to, to run through them quickly, it's certainly um, algae farmers and seaweed farmers. It's uh, absolutely uh, medical researchers, um, including mainstream ones, who are like, even if I could get out, if, even if I could move our experiments out onto a seastead for six months and then bring them back and go through the whole regulatory process of the FDA, that could save a major pharmaceutical company, you know, $100 million. 
Uh, people in the industry have actually told me this. Um, so, you know, we'll build a, you know, we build factories worth a billion dollars just to put, produce one drug. We'll, we'll pay for a Seastead too. Um, and, uh, certainly people working in materials science. Um, I, one of the biggest business models is simply ecotourism and people wanting to, um, be in an incubation hub where other people are working to be, uh, pioneers. There's people with uh, that want to sell flagging rights. I mean, if you just think about, you know, if you had a cruise ship that never docked and floated out there permanently, and it could be its own nation, um, there's there's all sorts of ways to rethink how your business would work in a different sort of regulatory environment. And one of the big ones is definitely floating hospitals. Uh, Devi Shetty, who I feature in the book, who's Mother Teresa's former heart surgeon, he's been called the Henry Ford of, of uh, heart surgery uh, offers, you know, just a huge humanitarian has, has just saved many, many lives with his low cost heart surgery in India. Uh, he actually said in the economic times um, that the best place to have a hospital is floating offshore an existing American city. And, and given that he doesn't have that, he's, he's already built a health city in the Cayman islands so businesses are already flying their employees down there to get their uh, knee transplant while on vacation in the Cayman Islands because it's cheaper to do it that way with a butler and a concierge surface than it is to have them get their knee replacement surgery uh, in the U.S. So there's, there's innovators trying to get out the side the old regulatory structures in pretty much every – business and industry you can name that you would need to build society from the ground up. Uh, and we can even do it from the water up. So uh, you name it, somebody in that industry is reaching out to us and they tend to be the most uh, innovative and entrepreneurial sports. Now, as I mentioned, you, you are very optimistic throughout the whole book, and we often ask our guests uh, if they're optimistic because we have guests who have you know, apocalyptic uh, predictions about various things, And but but you seem optimistic. So uh, is that accurate? Do you, you think that you, – would you be surprised if by 2050 there wasn't some substantial seasteading presence in the world? Well, I like to think that I'm not an optimist. I like to think that I look at the evidence and – do my best to determine what's most likely. And I'm, I'm very influenced by Matt Ridley, who wrote uh, The Rational Optimist. Uh, incidentally, he blurbed the seasteading book. I'm very proud of that. And, uh, you know, his book is very much about, like, just look at the evidence. Uh, does it say that the apocalypse is coming? Or does it say that things are trucking along okay? Or does the evidence suggest that things are spectacularly getting better uh, in pretty much every measure of well-being we can measure globally. And surprise, surprise, it defies human intuitions. Everything is getting much, much better in most areas. Uh, I'm interested in seasteading and the startups uh, governance, uh, startup societies movement, because I think governance is the most important service, and it's the thing that's getting worse and worse and worse. And I don't think humanity can survive unless we solve that problem. But... Um, uh, I'm also uh, influenced by Nassim Taleb, which is you can look at all the trends and say it's all getting spectacularly better. But the thing that will, could set us back is a black swan. It's something you and I are not going to talk about. Just like the solutions are beyond our imaginings, the thing that could completely screw us up um, is something we're not talking about. Um, you know, who knows, some cloud of methane gas below the Earth's crush, there could be an earthquake and it could be released and we'd all be, you know, wiped out and none of us were worried about it. So um, all the trends suggest that we have a lot to be positive about. The trends in governance and uh, uh, fiat currencies, I think, are very negative. But I think uh, blockchain tech and seasteading and startup societies could be solving that problem. I think it's looking up. I think our uh, children and grandchildren will be much wealthier than w the wealthiest people today. But there could be some black swan that comes out of nowhere and screws up everything. So uh, I'm, I, I hope I'm an optimist because the 
evidence suggests I should be an optimist. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.